स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया part of our discussion on marxism uh, you will recall that we uh, dealt with some of the important points of marxism as a cultural theory in our last lecture which was lecture 8 in uh, the series of lectures on cultural studies as you know these lectures have been um, uh, are being recorded Uh, under the national program on technology enhanced learning and uh, these courses are uh, basically for uh, the students of uh, engineering and technology and um, we are trying to bring uh, to them uh, some areas from the humanities and social sciences uh, but we also hope that some of these uh, lectures that we are delivering under this program would also be helpful for students uh, who are from the humanities and social sciences at least uh, to help them uh, recapitulate some of the elementary and basic uh, knowledge that um, uh, you know we would do well to remember even as we move on to higher studies so uh, welcome then once again to Uh, this lecture on marxism and um, before that let's do a quick recap um this is on what we did um, last time in the last lecture um uh, we looked at this uh, school of uh, thought in the history of ideas known as historical materialism and uh, uh, we said that marxism as a cultural theory studies the structure and change okay of society for uh, the questions that we uh, can ask here are for instance how are societies organized and structured and how do societies develop and change so uh, they uh, we look at both you know uh, the structure of Uh, uh, of society of culture as well as how these change the reasons why these change at all we looked at um the school of thought that was you know the reigning school of thought during marx's time and we said that it was idealism um and the, the best uh, representative during those times was the philosopher hegel Uh, idealism um, argued that our you know our actions our actions okay are the result of abstract ideas and ideas uh, were seen as being independent of the material world and the world itself was seen as a reflection of uh, ideas or the absolute spirit as hegel would have it next we looked at the law of dialectics uh, uh, you know as the law um, behind the movement you know the change in uh, in history and we saw that a uh, dialectics is is defined as a development that repeats okay repeats historical stages but repeats them in a higher level okay uh, and uh, resulting in a development that is not smooth but a development by leaps catastrophes and revolutions uh we also saw the three words okay thesis antithesis and synthesis right this is these are the three levels so to speak um uh, of movement okay uh till we reach the and we reach a synthesis and i also said that synthesis is uh, the uh, uh, one synthesis is the thesis for the next movement well um in contrast to hegelian idealism 
uh, we found that nature or matter and not ideas ok. Nature and matter uh, or matter is held primarily and instead of dialectical idealism, we found that Marx and Engels talked about dialectical materialism ok. So, the dialectical part remains, but uh, uh, you know um, where uh, it comes from, whence it happens that has changed from ideas to matter. So, Hegelian dialectics uh, plus, plus materialism gives rise to dialectical materialism. Uh, next we saw uh, which uh, what I said was uh, or is or it forms the basis of Marxist theory uh, and uh, what uh, was it? It goes like this that social cultural change uh, you remember social cultural change occurs when the forces of production come in conflict with the relations of production. Okay. Um, social uh, forces of production for example, technology and the relations of production are the social organization that uh, happens in a particular way or mode of production. Uh, we also looked at two very important quotations from Marx, uh, which involve um, the fact that human beings enter into this different uh, relations of production. Okay which are independent of their will or desire and that these relations of production uh, correspond to a definite stage of development of the material forces. Okay. And then we looked at uh, two, imp two uh, you know important concepts which I will talk about more today the concepts of base and superstructure. Right. Well, then um, we also looked at uh, this quotation from Marx. Uh, he says that we make our own history, but we cannot make it the way we like it or we, the way we wish it to be in the sense that uh, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, but these circumstances are ones that are transmitted from the past. So, we are not free, we can never be in the Marxist framework, okay? uh, never be free from the past and it is like you know, it weighs like a nightmare in Marx's words on the brain of the living. Then uh, we also looked at two, two other again very seminal uh, you know uh, pronouncements in Marxism okay? and it is this that the mode of production recall what are the mode of uh, productions or let me uh, we will go to uh, that once again let me read this. The mode of production determines the general character of the social, political and intellectual processes of life in the sense that you may think that the ideas that you hold are yours, but in a, in a, in a Marxist cultural framework we would argue in the following way okay, that it is the mode of production, the material mode of production and the organization uh, um, thereof that determines the political, social and intellectual processes of life. Remember in this we are not uh, uh, Marx is not saying that it is deterministic. Okay, he would mean it in the sense of you know it is it is uh, determined uh, in the sense of it is guided by or it sort of corresponds to. But um, it would be a vulgar Marxism which Marx never meant to say that it is completely deterministic. Then it is not the consciousness of men which determines their existence. It is on the contrary their social existence which determines their consciousness. Okay. Our awareness not of just objects or things, but our awareness of social processes, our uh, uh, the ideas that we hold, the values that we hold, all these um, are determined by our social existence okay. and it is not the other way around. This uh, according to me is one of the most important, one of the most seminal uh, um, you know, uh, seminal ideas in Marxism as far as our um, you know our you know mega question is concerned and what was our mega question that why do we live the kind of lives that we live okay and the answer would be from Marxist cultural theory that our social existence that determines the kind of life that we live and that comes from the particular mode of production existing in that time. So, we are in a way tied to history, we are tied 
to our social circumstances. Okay, so um, this is what you will find in the Communist Manifesto by uh, Marx and Frederick Engels, okay, in the beginning of the Communist Manifesto. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle and the most important word here is class. Okay? Uh, class is a, a, you know, a, a very seminal concept in Marxist uh, theory okay? and he Marx divided uh, classes um, in, uh, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in a in a in you could say a bi in two binaries okay of those who owned the means of production and those who worked right um, for instance uh, well you have the master and the slave in uh, these are the two classes okay in a mode of production that was ancient slavery okay so ancient slavery then would determine the social existence and thereon the consciousness okay of people then during feudalism uh, please look at the slide here during feudalism uh, you had the overlord and the serf now just before that we had the master and the slave in uh, a situation of ancient slavery uh, in feudalism we had the overlord and the serf in a capitalist uh, system we have the bourgeoisie and the proletariat okay or the capitalist and the laborer and in a situation of imperialism you have the colonizer and the colonized so let's go back to the quotation the history of all hitherto existing society then may be read as a history of class struggles now these are the classes that are pitted against one another uh, on uh, the basis of <laughs> who owns the means of production okay therefore the relationship between uh, social classes, okay, the relationship between these classes um, is in uh, is not equal. It's unequal. Okay, why is it unequal? Because some a very few of uh, few who form uh, you know the first part of the binary opposition, uh, they own the means of production. Okay, so when they own the means of production, they are um, you know by extension also. Um, you know, you could say uh, determiners of our social existence and the consciousness that we carry. Uh, they are uh, the relationship is also exploitative. Why is it exploitative? Because um, uh, you know the profit that is accrued, okay, in any mode of production which has these binaries of ones who own the means of production and the ones who do not, will always be exploitative. Okay, the profit is. Um, the profit is collected by uh, the you know the class in the first part of the binary opposition okay and um, it is founded on a conflict of interest right uh, the the relationship is one there will always be a conflict of interest the interest of the first uh, part of the binary you know uh, of, of that class the exploiting class is that they would always want to earn profit and the interest from the point of view of uh, the, the other class okay, on the right hand side of the binary opposition that, that is exploited would, would be definitely something else would be in their own interest. We come to another concept and you can see here on the screen the concept of alienation. Okay. Uh, Marx dwelt on the concept of alienation. Um, not just with reference to you know um, to, to only uh, the, the exploited okay if we extend it alienation is a concept now how do you understand alienation alienation is to be separate from something your it comes from the word alien okay as you know and to be alienated is to be separated from something okay now let us see how it is articulated first Man is a creative worker. Okay, we are not just mechanic, uh, mechanistic beings. We are creative workers. But with the emergence of private property, man is alienated from the following. As uh, you know, we learned just a while ago, what is 
uh, you know, uh, the, what is the motive behind having a system in which only few, uh, you know, only few people earn or, or rather own the means of production. Obviously, it is private property, okay, the, the uh, accumulation of private property and the accumulation of um, a surplus which is not shared, okay, with the other half of the binary opposition. So, with the emergence of private property, man is alienated from the following. Okay? Now, in uh, this case, we uh, first uh, you know, consider only the laborer. Okay? Now, a laborer is alienated or he is separated from A, the product of his labor. Okay? The laborer contributes in the production process and his labor, okay? the fact that he works which is according to Marx a power, the labor is a power and we have the concept of labor power. Uh, the product of a laborer's work okay, is something he or she is not entitled to. Okay. So, in the first place the laborer is alienated or separated from the very product okay, that has come up because or owing to his or her labor. Second, the very act of producing, right? man is separate or separated or alienated from the very act of, of producing. Uh, particularly when you consider um, assembly line production for instance, factory production for instance, what do we see? We see that you know it is in, in, in so many cases it is not a creative act, uh, one is almost like a cog in a wheel or co in a cog in a machine. Okay? Um, uh, where uh, you know you are doing work that is repetitive, that is monotonous, boring, that does not really uh, include a lot of uh, creativity. Okay, so the very act of producing in a production process uh, may be something that the laborer is uh, is something that the laborer is alienated from. Then third, the worker is alienated. Okay, or separated from himself as a producer. Okay, in the whole production process, he is separated or alienated from the very fact that he or she is a producer. And finally, a laborer is alienated or separated from other producers, okay, from people who or you know or his peers, his, his people who work with him right in the production process are separated. So, uh, we saw quickly again that man is a creative worker who is separated from the product uh, from uh, who is alienated so to speak in four different ways a from the product of his labor, b from the act of producing, c from himself as a producer and d from the other produ producers in the production process. Now, that is uh, why the fact that uh, you know uh, the system is uh, exploitative wherever there is this binary okay um, the system is exploitative and uh, the theory of communism is then summed up in one sentence okay abolish all private property now this is something that um, you may you know imagine uh, very difficult for some of you maybe to imagine a way of life in which there is no private property Okay, but Marx and Engels and other Marxists argue that it is possible to have um, a sort of life that is like a commune, right, where you do not own private property. More about this a while later. Now, again, coming back to alienation, okay, which is a result of private property, alienation degrades not just the, you know, not just the workers. Now he says here, alienation degrades both the bourgeoisie that is uh, the capitalist class and the proletariat that is uh, the laboring class. Okay? So, it is, uh, it is something that happens to both classes, whereas in the first go you may feel that it is only the laborer who is alienated in four different ways, okay? but it is not so. Now, I am <coughs> quoting here from Marx, the property class and the class of the proletariat present the same human self estrangement. The self estrangement obviously is a synonym for alienation. So, both the class that owns the property and the class of the proletariat or the laborer, okay, they have, they both are alienated. But, you know, the formal, uh, the former class 
that is the property class okay, or the um, class which owns uh, the means of production. The former class feels at ease and strengthened in this self estrangement. So, uh, even they are, they are alienated, the situation is such for that class that they feel strengthened by this, this uh, uh, self estrangement or alienation. It recognizes estrangement as its own power. For them, being alienated, you know, from from uh, 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 the proletariat, being alienated in in a couple of other ways. Okay, as we saw, uh, it is something that is to be celebrated. It is something that uh, is for their own convenience. It is uh, something that gives them power. Okay, this is uh, how even though both classes are. Uh, you know, alienated. The, there is a difference in how they perceive that alienation. Okay. So, uh, whereas, but now let me get this slide here, please. The class of the proletariat, right? The the other class, the class of the proletariat. It sees in its own powerless, uh, you know, powerlessness, and the reality of an inhuman existence. The alienation, which is the source of power for uh, the capitalist class and is considered as something desirable, uh, in, the, in the case of the proletariat or the laborer, uh, the, this class sees in such alienation its own powerlessness okay? and uh, what they, they perceive as an inhuman existence. Now, within this antithesis, the private property owner is therefore the conservative side. Now, you would call them the conservative. Okay, why? Because simply look at the word conservative. They want to conserve, they want to preserve how things are. They want to preserve the relations of production. They want to preserve the, the mode of production that is going on simply because the alienation that happens okay, only strengthens them and is a source of power. From the former arises the action of preserving the antithesis. But in the case of the latter, that is in the case of the proletariat or the laborer, okay, from the latter, we have the action of annihilating it. Okay. Therefore, they are the progressive side. Now, you, you, I am sure you must have, uh, you know, heard of these two terms, okay, which is, um, sorry, uh, which is the, the, you know, the conservatives versus the progressives. Why are uh, the proletarians known as the progressive and the, the uh, capitalists known as the conservatives? Because, as I said earlier, they the first in the first instance they want to conserve uh, the things as they are, the organization and the and the relations of production as they are. Okay, and on the other hand, uh, the other class wants to progress. That is, they want to break break these and they want to go, they wish to go ahead to a better uh, uh, system of organization. Okay? So, uh, uh, I hope you have understood, uh, you know, that the system of alienation, which many people say, uh, you know, only the laborer is alienated, is not as it seems. Okay? Both classes of the exploiter and the exploited in this, uh, uh, within this cultural uh, theory framework, okay, are actually estranged or alienated. Um, <coughs> Then this, you know, this whole concept. I've been using the word exploitation. Um, how is, uh, you know, how how is this sort um, to be maintained? For instance, now Marx, uh, Marxist theorists would argue this, that you know, all classes, okay, for that matter, anyone who ex exploits uh, somebody else or some other class in the system, uh, gives the moral justification, okay that this exploitation is being done to towards there is a certain moral uh, rationale for this. Okay? So, there is uh, always a moral justification of class rule in that you know they would say something like this that ours you know if you look at this slide here ours or our system is the highest is the most natural form of social development. Okay? So, we have reached the stage which is the best. So, every you know era or every mode of production Okay, would uh, you know? For instance, um, in ancient slavery, also they would have said that ours is the best form of social development. Do you follow? Uh, capitalism would say that ours is the highest and most importantly that it is the most natural form. For instance, if you uh, let's go back to a time when there was absolute monarchy, right? So in absolute monarchy, what was the justification 
of you know the rule of the monarch of the king the justification would be something like this that that you know the the king rules because the rule of the king is the most natural form now the fact that it is natural the fact that it is a given uh, what is what is the idea behind it the idea behind is it would be something like the divine right of kings that kings have a divine right kings have a right given to them by god to rule okay so in the, these are ways in which uh, you know the the exploitation of one class over over another is thought to be justified that it is the morally best form uh, ever that was there uh, then i would like to quote this uh, beautiful passage from marx political economy okay regards the proletarian like a horse he must receive enough to enable him to work it does not consider him during the time when he is not working as a human being it leaves this to criminal law doctors religion statistical tables politics and the people okay so the the worker is like a horse and uh, you don't have to give him or her uh, a lot just enough for him or her you know, okay you know the 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 moral justification would be this okay so it's you know, like an animal you will work uh, feed him or give him uh, wages that are just enough for him to sustain himself and his or her family okay so um, in marx's in marx's work when you read das kapital for instance one is one is uh, so struck by the images that he uses the metaphors you know there's so many resonances from literary work for instance that many have said that das kapital is like poetry okay it is not just uh, uh, you know a dry piece of work there's so many allusions and as you know marx was so widely read right uh so you in in many uh, in so many uh, um, uh, so many chapters you find uh, you know passages that are so poetic then well uh just a while ago uh, we were uh, you know uh, we were talking about social existence and how social existence determines our consciousness and uh, we had uh, you know we looked at uh, two concepts where you know one is uh, the the foundation of uh, society and the other is uh, you know the social consciousness we have we will uh, we are going to work it out a bit more now and we are going to give them uh, we are going to give them particular names and these names are these terms are base and superstructure there are two things here now one now let's go one by one uh, the first is the base the base is what is the infrastructure or the economic base of society the economic base of society comprises um, broadly speaking two things okay you have uh, an economic arrangement say uh, you know i work and i get paid for my work somebody pays me right so in that case we have a certain you know a uh, certain kind of forces of production we call the term forces of production and the relations of production okay and uh, what else do you recall that society changes when these two come in conflict now uh, in a, a you know in a structure where there is a foundation or there is a base okay these this base is uh, um this base comprises two things the forces of production and the relations of production okay for instance um in a mode of production in a way of production that is feudal for instance okay a land becomes the most important force of production hmm? and uh, as far as the relations of uh, of production are concerned uh, it is marked by basically the two binaries of the lord uh, or the owner of the land and the tenant or the serf okay who works on that uh, over the base okay now this is really an architectural metaphor being used here over the base uh, there arises something called the superstructure okay now what is the superstructure the superstructure that arises on the base are uh, or it comprises the political and ideological relationships now go back the first in the first case we have the economic relationships okay as shown by the forces of production and the corresponding relations of production in the second case 
So, you have the political ideological relationships ok. That is uh, the argument is the way in which you find the base, the situation in which you find the base or the uh, whatever characterizes the base ok. That is going to determine though I would again hasten to say not in a fully deterministic way in a mechanical deterministic way that this absolutely causes because it, it is a little more complex than that ok. It will give rise to certain political institutions, certain ideological relationships right and uh, look at the next slide here. Um, down here we have the base ok which as I have said comprises relations of production and the forces of production. Uh, now, this base and the situation or the circumstances or the nature of the base will give rise to a certain superstructure. Now, what have we here in the superstructure? Those in the superstructure we have the for instance legal system, we have a family, we have education religion and finally, consciousness ok. So, these the legal system, family, education, religion these are what these are political ideological institutions right. They give rise to certain relationships ok. Now, the legal system, family, education and religion uh, are not there in any given point of time in history just like that just on their own right why do we have certain legal system why why does the legal system itself develop or, or 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 change why are there amendments made why are there changes in educational policy for instance why does the family change ok you know for instance we have the joint family now and before that we had different kinds of family um, uh, uh, in in um, today we have you know the nuclear family right. Um, so, the family system uh, in the uh, you know in education again for instance which was very different in, 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 in olden times ok. These are uh, so to speak these are determined by the mode of production that is there in the base. So, if it is a feudal system then the laws would be ok laws would be owing to what is there in the base in owing to that particular mode of production ok. Family, education, religion all these would be determined by the mode of production in the base and finally, our consciousness ok. Our consciousness of which holds everything what we think about the values that we have our awareness of things our perceptions ok. That is also part of the superstructure and this very consciousness which we think is our very own our own ego again for instance ok that is our own subjectivity now, more on subjectivity later on in the next module uh, um, our subjectivity included these are actually determined by the economic arrangements in the base. Therefore, this very very beautiful statement ok. The ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of its ruling class. Now, let us look at this again in every age there will be some ideas ok, some beliefs, some values, uh, some uh, way of thinking ok, which are the ruling or another word for it the which are the dominate uh, dominant ideas. These ideas are held to be so to speak true, these ideas are held to be uh, to be you know um, adhered to or subscribed to by everybody. So, these are ideas that are reigning or ruling so to, so to speak in a particular age. Now, where do these ideas come from? Now, you will recall that in idealism ok, Hegel would say that ideas these ideas are the reflection of ideas that are uh, the ideas that are uh, emanating from from uh, the absolute spirit or ideas that are emanating from uh, or from something that is not related to the material world ok. Uh, Marxism or dialectical materialism or historical materialism would say that our ideas come from how uh, our material lives are arranged and these so called dominant ideas are actually the ideas of the class that is in power during that time. What does it mean to say that? It means to say that the ideas that you and I hold if we are not critical beings, if we do not think critically 
if we simply consume ideas, we need to be careful because those ideas are serving the interest of somebody else. Okay? And whose interest? Serving the interest of the class that uh, at the moment is in power. Right? So, this brings us to a term really, um, because we are talking about ideas here. Okay? This brings us to a term which I would again uh, look at more uh, deeply some other time okay, in the, probably the next module. However, we can just have a quick uh, preview of it here. Um, this term is ideology. Now, how do we define ideology? Ideology uh, is defined as a set of ideas okay, or it is defined as uh, you know, um, lenses uh, or also as maps of meaning. So, ideology is a set of ideas, values, uh, approach to the world, approach to reality that um, uh, you know you and I hold. Okay? So, you have a set of beliefs for instance, you look at this slide, you have a set of beliefs about what the world is. Uh, why is the world, uh, you know, or rather uh, I look at the word, world through uh, these lenses. So, I am for instance a materialist in the sense that I believed in Marxism, believe in Marxism. So, I, I you know have a set of beliefs. Okay? I have a set of beliefs which makes me understand the world and everything in it as emanating from a certain economic base. Okay? Or, or if I am a very religious person, then I own a different set of beliefs. My set of beliefs would be more like the idealist. I would uh, argue that uh, you know, I look at the world and look at uh, all my activities from the point of view of religion. I look at it, I look at if something happens to me, I look at it as a punishment for something I did maybe in my last life or uh, something uh, you know uh, uh, or uh, that I have not followed the rules of religion of the scriptures and um, here is a God that has punished me. So, we you know these are also maps and if you look at the slide here the, the third meaning is you know these are uh, ideology um, uh, refers to maps of meaning, how we make meaning out of our lives okay? and how we make meaning out of our lives is conditioned by a set of beliefs. Now, this set of beliefs are again in turn conditioned, conditioned by what? Conditioned by the base. Okay? So, quickly let us again look back at that uh, you know this, this uh, the architecture of the base and the superstructure. So, my ideology would, would uh, uh, be a result of the relations of production and the forces of production that is the mode of production that is going on okay, which determines all these things from which arise my set of beliefs about the world. So, well Barker here says that you know ideology is so much a part of you know uh, so much part and parcel of Marxism that he says uh, or cultural studies he says that so influential has the concept of ideology been within cultural studies that the whole field was once that ideological studies. Okay? So, cultural studies was once uh, even called by somebody or some people uh, ideological studies, the study of ideology. Okay? Uh, we come now to, because we are talking about ideology, we come to um, a very important um, important figure here and uh, you must, uh, um, some of you are, are aware of this person, the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci. Okay? You know his prison notebooks are, uh, you know, among his most famous of work, uh, famous of his work. Okay? Now, uh, with Gramsci, uh, you know, we come to the idea uh, um, of ideology as you know being fleshed out, right? So I'm reading from Chris Barker, as you know, Chris Barker's uh, Cultural Studies Theory and Practice uh, is uh, one seminal text in this course. Okay, as far as um, you know, the entire course is concerned. Every uh, now and then, when I talk about uh, you know in certain modules, I may take up uh, a particular text, for instance, in evolutionary psychology or mimetics. Yet uh, we had uh, we took recourse to particular texts, but as a whole, if I uh, you know um, uh, when, if I uh, were to pick a book that uh, uh, one can use in a uh, cultural studies course uh, or at this level, uh, Barker's book would be uh, a good choice. So for Gramsci, I'm reading from Barker. From Gramsci, ideology is grasped as ideas, meanings, and practices which while they purport to be universal truths 
are maps of meaning that support the power of particular social classes. Okay. Uh, uh, I should hasten to add here there are of course other books, you know, other books by uh, Barker and, and uh, uh, when you look at concepts, you could do well to look at uh, the sage, um, uh, the sage handbook of cultural studies, from which I think this uh, I have taken uh, this particular, uh, you know, quotation from. Well, let's look at it again. For Gramsci, ideology is what is grasped as ideas, meanings, and practices which while they purport to be universal truths are maps of meaning that support the power of particular social classes. So, even though the word ideology comes from the word idea or ideas, uh, for Gramsci ideology is not just idea or the thought in your head, okay, it is also the practices. Okay. So, next here ideology is not separate, now this is the point. Here, ideology is not separate from the practical activity. That is, ideology is not just your thought. It is um, the practical activities are also part of it. Here, ideology is not separate from the practical activities of life, but provides people with rules of practical conduct and moral behavior. You have a certain idea in your head, and that is going to guide your practical behavior. That is going to guide your practical conduct, your moral behavior. Why? you behave in a certain supposedly moral way, because you hold that you have a framework in which some things are morally good and some things are morally unsound. So, uh, uh, let us look at uh, this again, ideology is understood to be both lived experience and a body of systematic ideas. Okay, then this is the, that's the beauty of uh, you know this uh, you know this extension here, as I said, this fleshing out. Ideology is both lived experience and it is a uh, you know a body of systematic ideas whose role is to organize and bind together a block of diverse social elements. So um, along um, with ideology, they, we come to uh, another word here, which is uh, the concept of hegemony. Okay. A hegemony is usually understood when you read your history in your school, for instance, you may have come across words like hegemonic uh, rule. For instance, there is this ruler here, okay, and then he's, uh, there is a hegemonic rule, he has hegemony over a certain territory. Now, uh, we extend that to hegemony over the mind, okay, rule over the mind. And, uh, you know, unlike as it is understood in uh, hegemonic territorial rule, in this case we say that hegemony or a rule over our minds, so to speak, rule over our ideas uh, is not always something that has been forced into you. It is not something that is coercive. Okay? So, look at this slide here please. We have this uh, concept of the first one manufactured consent your consent, your agree, you know, the fact that you agree to be in the system, okay, the fact that you agree to the, uh, you know, with the ideas, the fact that you agree as to what is moral, immoral, etcetera, is manifest, your consent, uh, uh, the fact, uh, your agreement, so to speak, is one that has been manufactured. Okay, you may not be aware of it, okay, but in ideology and hegemony studies, we say that our consent, so to speak, to a certain convention is one that has been manufactured. Manufactured uh, then by what? Now, look at the second point here, uh, manufactured by the processes of socialization. Okay? Now, what are the processes of socialization? First is the family. Okay? Your family uh, trains you to be, a so, uh, to be you know, a part of society. We are trained to be social beings. Okay? Then next you go to school. The education system is another institution, like the family is an institution, which carries out further this process of socialization. And finally, you have the cultural institutions, like religion for instance, again they have certain, you know, religion will tell you how to behave, okay, what to hold as being moral or immoral, right. Uh, education as I mentioned and the mass media. The mass media you know, the media uh, are a very, very powerful source of manufacturing this. If you consume, if you consume say soap operas or you have this television serials or the news for instance, if you consume, simply consume it without, ha you know, critically questioning the representation in the media for instance, 
then you are being uh, socialized, right? Uh, you are being socialized and your, your consent is manufactured. Yes, I, I accept it as it is. Okay? Uh, advertising, if you look at advertisements, advertising is also one way of manufacturing your consent. How? Uh, it is often said that um, you know, the desire for an object is created in you even before you begin to desire that object. Right? If you do not see something being advertised the way it is, the way it is shown as something as some, something that you have to possess and just look at you know, the, the lines that they use, the slogans that are used, okay? uh, you are being, well, we are being processed, uh, we are being socialized through these processes. Okay? So, our consent is not, a one, well, not one that is always forced, okay? our consent is very cleverly manufactured. Next again with uh, uh, hegemony. This is uh, leadership with uh, here with leadership we mean the ones uh, we are talking about the ones who are in power for instance the class that is in power and in Marxist terminology. Um, lead, uh, hegemony is seen as leadership with the consent of the led. Say we are led by leaders, but with our consent. Remember our consent is manufactured. Now, uh, I will talk um, very quickly about another theorist whose name is Louis Althusser and Althusser divided this, you know, this consent, so to speak, okay, uh, this hegemony into two ways of doing it. And I said, one is uh, the repressive state apparatuses known um, popularly in Marxist studies as the RSAs. The repressive state apparatuses are the coercive measures, for instance, the police Okay, the army, um, uh, you know, uh, the legal system, these are coercive in the sense that if you do not follow them, right, they are, you know, apparatuses, so to speak, of the state, of the government, okay, uh, which force you. Now, you are, uh, you, you will be booked if, you know, so you are coerced into following um, uh, those and he also calls them repressive. And the second kind, the second way is ideological state apparatuses. These uh, ideological state apparatuses or the ISAs are really not coercive, okay, but they are apparatuses non nonetheless. Okay. They are referred to not as the hard policing that we saw in the first case. We okay. look at the first case, which is the repressive state apparatus, coercive. The say next, the other kind is the ideological. Uh, want to do with ideas, which is which we call soft policing. Um, the ideological state apparatuses is getting your consent not by coercive measures, by get, but, but but getting your uh, uh, sorry, getting your uh, consent through uh, a soft policing or through ideological practices. For instance, we looked at mass media, we looked at education. These are not coercive. You are not put to jail if you are not going for education or if you are not, you're not put to jail if you do not don't, don't, uh, watch the television or you know if you, um, if you speak out against the representation of women for instance in television. Okay? But uh, they are apparatuses in the sense that without if you are not aware, if you are not conscious about it, okay, you uh, these are also ingrained. right? they are ingrained into you through these kind of soft policing. So, Louis Althusser is um, the theorist that uh, I happen to mention here, okay? uh, very quickly of course. Mm, uh, well, now let us uh, let's look at this slide. Uh, the cultural forms or products okay, in various, various media, various kinds of media, the cultural forms or products are what? They are ways or modes of representation. Now, representation is another word in which where I will devote maybe a lecture or two in the next module when we go to the key concepts. Okay. Uh, for now, it's, it suffices to say that uh, the various products that we see in the media. Now, your media means not just the television or the radio uh, or newspapers, it also could mean uh, literature is really, uh, you know, media or uh, uh, um, a, perfor a performance. In our performance in art or painting, these are media in the sense that they are, um, you know, medium source of meat, right? Uh, they are ways of or modes of representation, and these representations, okay, it is held in Marxist cultural theory. These representations are there to serve the dominant classes. 
So, uh, uh, these involve uh, institutionalized processes of production, distribution and consumption of these cultural products. These cultural products which are given to us to various media, they are uh, their distribution, the production and distribution and consumption, uh, it is not that they just happen. Okay? The production, distribution and consumption of these cultural products are, uh, are sort of channelized, so to speak, by the dominant classes. Censorship, for instance, is, is a case in point here. Okay? So, uh, whether you are allowed to consume a certain kind of art uh, uh, product okay, and how it is distributed and what are the rules in its production in the first place. Right? So, look at the slide once again. Production, distribution and consumption of any cultural artifact or product, okay? these come to us via certain institutionalized processes. These institutionalized processes are part of the, are they part of the base or the superstructure? They are a part of the superstructure. Therefore, in uh, cultural studies, the whole, whole uh, you know, in Marxist cultural studies, the whole concept of meaning formation is seen here. Uh, articulated as a tussle for meaning, okay, by uh, uh, where dominant groups uh, give us ideologies or worldviews in a bid to maintain the status quo and for standardization, okay, so that everybody believes and uh, uh, believes in it and consumes the ideological and cultural products. Therefore, class and culture are intertwined, bourgeois cultural forms and we have for proletarian culture. It is not that proletarians do not have their cultural forms, but this question of taste, you know, what is in good taste and what is in bad taste, what is high culture, what is in what is low culture, okay, uh, it is it is determined by class concerns. Now, um, uh, the state um, uh, of communism, for instance, uh, uh, is seen as uh, by Marx as uh, a state in which from you know there will be a situation in which each person would take you know would take according would give contribute to society according to his or her own ability and to each would be given what he or she needs. Uh, I would like to quickly end with um, a quotation before I go on to one or two questions which to me is, is something uh, that is so beautifully put again as you find in other cases in Marx. The way of life in communism as envisaged by Karl Marx is this. In communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he, he wishes, society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter fishermen, herdsmen or critics. Now, quickly let us go to the discussion. Um, what is base and superstructure? What are base and superstructure? Base uh, is the infrastructure of the economic base of a society, whereas superstructure is what arises over it, the political and ideological relationships. Um, what is man alienated from in circumstances where private property is present in the following way, from his labor, from the act of producing, from himself as a producer and from other producers. What is ideology? Ideology may be defined as a set of beliefs or lenses or maps of meaning. What is hegemony? Hegemony is leadership with the consent of the led and there are two types by as mentioned by Louis Althusser, these are the repressive state apparatus that are coercive and the ideological state apparatus that are not coercive, but they are soft policing and they are, uh, they are policing nonetheless. Explain false consciousness. What is it to have false consciousness? False consciousness are institutional uh, processes in which lead to the misrecognition of our true nature and our social realities. For instance, the bourgeois has a false consciousness um, uh, uh, and as well as the proletarian if they are not if they do not uh, realize that they are a class that, um, that are for itself. What according to Marx should philosophy do? According to Marx, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point however, is to change it. Finally, name two goals of communism. The two goals of communism may be uh, mentioned like this, to transform both the world and man's consciousness of the world and to achieve a state of communism 
and what was it as we saw a while ago in which a state in which each will give or contribute to society according to his or her own ability and each will get from society what each uh, of us uh, needs. Okay? So, uh, we have um, come to the, uh, to the end of uh, this lecture and uh, well, um, it is obvious that two lectures are not simply not enough to bring us Marxist cultural theory to you. However, uh, my hope is that uh, this is just the beginning and would lead you to the important works uh, by uh, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels and uh, the other Marxist critics uh, of, uh, you know, uh, who followed. And uh, you will um, look at uh, this as a theory that is so, uh, you know, uh, that is not, not just a theory to, to analyze our cultural lives. Okay? It is a theory as Marx said and we saw, it is a theory which also, uh, you know, it urges us, you know, to go in for change urges uh, us to interpret the world and at the same time to take up, uh, you know, uh, to, to act in a way in which we uh, uh, can make a system that is uh, not exploitative, you know, we can construct a system that is fair uh, to one and all. Thank you. <laughs>